weekly news review. News and analysis from this week in Venezuela. VenezuelaAnalysis.com Hi everyone and welcome to the Venezuela Analysis, Venezuela Weekly News Review. So usually on the Venezuela Weekly News Review, we try to cover a couple of the top stories from Venezuela for this week. But this week we're going to look at what I think is not only the top story of this week, uh, but also the top story of probably the last few weeks or, or possibly longer. Uh, the long-running battle between the Attorney General, Luis Odega, and the Supreme Court, or TSJ. Uh, so, I'm Ryan Malatoucher, a journalist with Venezuela Analysis, and I've got here Lucas Kerner, uh, another journalist from Venezuela Analysis. Uh, Lucas has actually just finished writing an article uh, titled, Is Venezuela's Attorney General Biased Towards the Opposition? It, the article should go up around the same time as this this uh, uh, this podcast goes up, so keep an eye out for it, and it's it's definitely worth a read. Uh, so I guess let's start the conversation by answering the question that's posed in the title of your article. What do you think, Lucas? Is Venezuela's attorney general biased towards the opposition? I think the short answer, as the title may imply, is definitely yes. That there, I think there is an active um, behavior or conduct on the part of the attorney general that is functional to the interests of the Venezuelan opposition and, you know, obviously it's, you know, foreign um, benefactors, particularly the United States. Um, but I think it's, it's not so simple and it's definitely very complicated um, in the sense that we, we should begin by some context that the, the long running, you know, this dispute between the Venezuelan opposition and, you know, the government, particularly this latest round of protests is, I'm sorry, Ryan. I'm like, my head is not here. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's all right. Just give it a second. Just pick up where you go. Where you're, where all right. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm exhausted. Okay. I, I just start the whole answer again, actually. So, like, what do you think? Yeah, it's, so we can just save your... Yeah. I mean, what, what do you, just like, I don't know. There's just, what do you, what, what do you want me to go with this? I don't know. Where should we go? No, just Whatever. Uh, I guess you could be like, yeah, sure, it is. Uh, you could start, I don't know, by contextualizing it if you want, or I don't know. What do you think? The idea behind this is it's supposed to be kind of casual, so it doesn't have to be, like, pitch perfect, you know? Like, when I'm talking, I'm just sort of, you know, just talking casually. It's just like, yeah, if I kind of fuck something up, it's like, yeah, whatever. Okay, just give me one second, and I'll be right back. Give me 30 right. seconds. going off. All right. Well, you know what? Let's just start again. Let's just start from the start. No, no, start but I like, I like the intro. Just keep the intro because you do the intro. So why? Is uh, it? I'll just do it again. Otherwise, I have to fuck around. It's quicker just to do the intro a second time. And, I don't know. All right. I'm going to try not to fuck up. It doesn't matter, though. The thing is, if you do fuck up, it's like, who cares? If it's like, the idea is it's supposed to be like a cash conversation. You know, that's what people want from a podcast. So it's okay. It doesn't really matter so much. All right. <laughs> If we could drink during this. <laughs> well, we could. We could. It could be like drinks for VA or something. Yeah. yeah cool. All right. All right. So just from the top, then, I guess. <clears throat> Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Venezuela Analysis, Venezuela Weekly News Review. So usually on the weekly news review, we try to cover a couple of the top stories from the week. 
Uh, but every so often we really try to mix things up with a few podcasts where a couple of us VA writers sit down and talk about what's on our minds and uh, go into a little bit of detail on maybe one of the top stories of a week uh, or something, you know, some pertinent topic on Venezuela. And this week we are picking something that is not only the top story of this week, but definitely the top story of the last few weeks, uh, maybe longer. And that is the long-running legal dispute or long-running legal battle between Venezuela's uh, Attorney General, Luis Ortega, and the Supreme Court, or TSJ for its abbreviation in Spanish. Uh, so I've got with me Lucas Kerner, who is another Venezuelan analysis writer, uh, and he has actually just finished writing an article called Is Venezuela's Attorney General Biased Towards the Opposition? Now, the article should be appearing on our website sometime within the next few hours, uh, probably around the same time as this video, or this, this podcast goes up, hopefully. So keep an eye out for it. It's really good. It goes into a lot of detail on the current legal battle between Ortega and the TSJ. Uh, so, Lucas, uh, what do you think? Is, I guess to answer the question posed in the title of your article, is Venezuela's Attorney General biased towards the opposition? I think the short answer is definitely yes, but I think it's it's complex. I would I would go as far to say that Luis Ortega, the Attorney General, is probably the most important actor in Venezuela, driving the extremely intense and violent polarization that we are seeing in the country right now. And I, mean, I think that's true for a number of reasons. I think that we have to go back to see like where where is this violence coming from? Why did this all start? And um, Basically, to give readers a little bit of background, 82 people have been killed in Venezuela since April 4th, and that that was that all this all goes back to the a controversial Supreme Court ruling on March 29th. And without going into the whole legal specifics of it, which is a nightmare, I'm just gonna leave it at basically the Supreme Court sought to temporarily give itself pow legislative powers in the face of a situation of contempt of court of the opposition-held National Assembly because the National Assembly has refused to dismiss three legislators who have been accused of voter fraud. And also, basically, since coming to power in January 2016, the, the opposition-held National Assembly has basically done little else than attempting to oust the Maduro government by any means necessary. I mean, just passing just like totally kind of like crazy pieces of legislation, like the amnesty law, which basically sought to like literally like pardon like pe like opposition people for like ta for literally there, were, there was dozens of crimes listed in Venezuela's penal code, like including like homicide, participation in like military rebellion, like, you know, drug trafficking, all kinds of things. It just like, you know, it was clearly, you know, not to say that there aren't perhaps, you know, pe you know, people in prison in Venezuela for, you know, reasons that are perhaps unfair, like in any other country in the world. But this was just went like completely, you know, way too far in attempting to just, you know, totally promote impunity. So this is basically just to give you kind of background of what this, you know, opposition led legislature legislature has done. And, you know, this is kind of like this all came to a head really, you know, at the end of March when the Supreme Court passed this, this ruling to, to give itself the power to approve legislation. This was in the context of Venezuela's National Assembly has refused to approve any new debt for Venezuela. And what this means is in a country that literally has like 10 billion in foreign reserves left due to the collapse of global oil prices in a country that depends for over 90 percent of its um, ex you know, dollar earnings on oil exports, exports, it means that, you know, Venezuela could go bankrupt. And this has been the strategy of Venezuela's opposition leaders. You know, Julio, Julio Borges has, has written, you know, over a dozen letters to um, international banks calling for them not to lend to Venezuela, you know, basically, you know, which is kind of like strange because like the Venezuelan opposition has pretty much been complaining, you know, has been on this campaign for the past, you know, really since Chavez was elected originally, but like, you know, re you know, obviously in a more convincing form over the past, you know, year or so and trying to convince the world that Venezuela is just like this dictatorship where people are like eating horses and like starving to get death and like breaking into zoos to eat animals and stuff. And like, they're clearly like, this is the picture they paint, but then they go out of their way to do everything possible to exacerbate that crisis. So the government fall will fall, you know, so it's kind of like a, 
you know, surreal kind of situation. So like, that's kind of like the broader context. And this, you know, this Supreme Court ruling kind of came in that, you know, not obviously there was, a, there was a lot of polarization around that because like Ortega came out and said that this is unconstitutional. And that was really, that was the first time that a high level government official and remember that Ortega, unlike in the United States, um, where the attorney general is, you know, appointed by the president as part of the executive branch and therefore, you know, kind of is supported. It is basically part of the head is the head law enforcement official or they, the in Venezuela or the the top prosecution. The prosecution is legally separate from the uh, law enforcement. It's a separate branch of government and is completely, you know, she's appointed to a seven year term for the, and is you know basically autonomous. You know, so anyone really claiming that, you know, Venezuela is a dictatorship kind of comes up against this fact that, well, then if Venezuela is a dictatorship, then why is there, you know, an open, you know, why why does the attorney general have so much autonomy, you know, in that sense? But I, I guess the, the point is she broke with the government in this extremely high profile move to uh, to oppose this, you know, controversial ruling. Keep in mind, the former Supreme Court um, excuse me, the former attorney general, ECF Rodriguez, had actually said it was constitutional. And from that moment, like this, 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 this violent opposition protests detonated the week of um, April 4th. So this is kind of the background. And again, so this is not like in this decision to oppose it. This was not like a unanimous decision by Venezuela's public prosecution. And this is Ortega. In fact, you saw that the, a, the vice attorney general actually resigned in opposition to Ortega's decision on this question. And, you know, the, the, the rumor is that, you know, this person, she resigned because she preferred to resign rather than to be fired, to be kicked out. And, and you know, we can get into this later, but there actually are, you know, allegations that there is a witch hunt going on against, you know, politically motivated witch hunting against government Maduro supporters, against Chavistas within the public prosecution. So, you know, basically to understand, so, while Ortega initially broke with the government on this question, and the, the, remember these rulings were reversed, and the opposition immediately, you know, moved, jumped on this and said, "Oh, we want the Supreme Court justices to be removed." And they had attempted to do this, you know, repeatedly because the Supreme Court has ruled against many of their just blatantly unconstitutional pieces of legislation, like privatizing the Venezuela's public housing, you know, one, uh, or for example, you know, the amnesty law. But, you know, so they jumped on this to call for the removal of the Supreme Court justices, which they had been attempting to do for, you know, over, you know, for months now. And, you know, but basically Ortega was silent after that. She didn't really, uh, after the, the ruling was reversed. You know, then we kind of see that the polarization with Ortega begin to intensify, you know, in April when she kind of comes out in this um unprecedented press conference and, you know, basically, you know, another, another dramatic press conference. And she um, basically refutes the, she, she basically suggests that um, what, what a number of, she basically comes out and she says that the, she, she basically blames the government for um, killing protesters. She, she, she says that, um, you know, the solution to the current confrontation, I'm paraphrasing, is not to put people in jail, which is kind of an interesting thing for the top prosecutor to say in the midst of a, you know, violent wave of opposition protests and other, other, any other country in the world would probably be repressed with mass, with mass arrests and like, if not like martial law, you know, so, so she comes out, she says this, she, um, she also like in the beginning of May, she gives an interview to the Wall Street Journal, you know, and for anyone who doesn't know, like the Wall Street Journal is, you know, a not exactly like, you know, objective, like, you know, <laughs> not exactly, you know, media outlet when it comes to Venezuela or basically anything, <laughs> um, you know, like, you know, for example, like they were the ones who like went, they, they, they were really the ones who spearheaded this, like this smear, like the completely unfounded smear story back in 2015 against the then um, president of the, of the National Assembly, Diosdado Cabello, saying he was like the like the head of like the like a cartel, <laughs> like it was like a Mexican drug cartel, like El, El Cartel Sol or something like. They just like made up this like random name. They said he's the head of it. Like they didn't provide any evidence. Like it was just completely you know a smear story, you know. And this is I mean they've done this repeatedly. This is this is not new. 
Um, so basically, the, she gave an inter she you know gave an interview to you know the Wall Street Journal, and you know she she said not only did she give an interview to the Wall Street Journal, she said again in the midst of these you know violent opposition protests and to give you know people if people who have not been like following our coverage you know I mean we're seeing these protests where people are being you know, set on fire at, at opposition protest, like being burnt alive. You know, I mean, this is the extent of, you know, the the absolutely, you know, I would say savage opposition violence that is being exercised. And not to say that all of the deaths are attributed to opposition violence, but there are, you know, the mainstream mer- narrative that the majority of deaths are caused by the government is, you know, clearly just false. I mean, uh, we, we, we've done the breakdown and, um I can just bring up the numbers right here. I mean, the, we we have at least um, twenty at least twenty two deaths that are actually caused directly or indirectly by opposition violence. You know, eleven deaths that are you know directly linked to authorities. You know, we have an, a number of deaths. You know, that are um, a number of these deaths that are um, caused by you know basically opposition barricades that just you know just causing traffic accidents by. You know, for example, just blocking a road and, you know, motorcyclists just collide as a result of that or, you know, things that are actually even more, um, you know, openly, I would say, sadistic yeah. in the sense of, you know, burning people alive or, you know, like lynching this, like, you know, this retired National Guard lieutenant, like at this funeral just because he was black or, you know, it's like... You know, because of this mob mentality. So again, I mean, this is not to say that they're all the opposition protests are this way. That you know, like clearly, like the mass majority protests, you know, have not resulted in lynchings. But you know, the, the fact that this is a, this is the, there is this radical element to it. Or exactly, not, exactly. Not so, just I mean, radical, I, but as you said, I liked the word you said, savage. It's like this is savage undercurrent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we should be, yeah, we should be, we should be really careful when we talk about the protests. Like, you know, we, we don't want to just say, oh, you know, all of this is just opposition pro- violence. And, you know, it's like people, you know, again, like as, as, as we're young people, like we have protested, you know, in our countries, like absolutely. And like, you know, to be a left, be on the left, you know, it's like a very difficult position to be on because like we, I, I'm not like in favor of like the state apparatus, like the state repressive apparatus. Like I am not like, you know, I, I don't think that it's good that, you know, protesters should be killed in the streets i think that and, and i think it's and it's it's shown that in all of, in these 11 cases there have been except with the in 10 cases except the one of uh, juan Fernandez, there have been prosecutions so i mean that this is important to know that it's not like there is impunity in fact what i argue in the, you know in this article which i encourage everyone to read is that you know when there are crucial cases of you know the the the, the state the, the state prosecution has been much harsher on I, you know, in cases in which this, the authorities are responsible for um, for killing protesters, in which they should be, they should be, they should, there should be no impunity there. But they have actually turned a blind eye to cases of opposition violence. I mean, we have five, we have at least five cases in which there have been no investigations whatsoever into victims of opposition political violence. Um, you know, which is you know absolutely un- unacceptable. I mean, just to give you one, you know, a, a few examples. Oliver Villa Comargo, he was literally like 10 minutes from my house, like in El Paraíso in Caracas. He was like driving his car, you know, trying to pass a barricade. He went around the barricade and some opposition, you know, presumably opposition, um, you know, motorcyclists, two people on a motorcycle came up and shot him in the face. And he literally drove for like five more minutes on the highway and they just stopped and died on the highway. I mean, this is just the kind of just like brutal, or you know, just like in the same in El Paraíso, the same place, very close to my house. This su- a fucking Supreme Court, um, excuse me, no, it wasn't a Supreme Court judge. It was a um, high profile. Um, it, it was it was a lower court judge, an appeal uh, appeals court judge, who was killed and who was also killed in a barricade, attempting to pass a barricade at 10 p.m. and he was shot in the face also. And you know, this, this in fact, he incidentally was the judge who had. Um, denied Leopoldo Lopez, the um, convicted Venezuelan opposition leader who had led, really uh, precipitated the previous round of Guarimba or, you know, opposition street violence right. in 2014. You know, he was the one who denied his, this, um, this opposition leader's appeal. Um, so not to suggest that this was necessarily a political murder, because, again, like Alvaro Villa Comargo, he was just some business guy, like, you know, 
who was just killed, you know, some young guy um, in his 30s who was just shot in the face. I mean, you know, it's tragic. I mean, this this could happen. This this is part of the, the I would say, I use the word terror. I don't, I use the word terror very deliberately because like this is the idea of this kind of violence is to sow terror, to sow a sense of ingovernability, you know, in which, you know, basically, re, you know, regime change can be pushed as a policy from, you know, from the outside externally. You know, and then you know, with the, with the aim that the you know the government can be removed, and I mean that it's it, it's it is terrifying in that sense, and you know the fact that it's you know just totally arbitrary violence exercised by these you know basically gangs of you know um, opposition youths largely, you know, so and many many of them from you know middle class or upper middle class you know backgrounds in the case of you know in Altamira and in Chacal. So the point is. Um, Again, you can you can see the rest of those you know people who have not been investigated. You know, it, you know we can go or Efren Sierra, another case in which he was you know at, also killed in a barricade in Tachira. Um, you know, Pedro Josu Carrillo, who's a, a 21 year old grassroots Chavista leader in um, Barquisimeto Lara State, who was kidnapped and executed. You know, we don't know by whom. The, yeah. the National Ombudsman has called it a hate crime. But regardless, it hasn't been investigated. You know, there's no investigation into that crime. You know, so clearly, I mean, that's a that's a very serious problem. And I argue that it promotes a climate of impunity in which, you know, these these victims of opposition violence are, you know, their lives matter less than those who are killed by opposition or excuse me, those who are killed by authorities who are, who are alleged to be killed by authorities in which they are honestly, they're put on a pedestal and they're held up as martyrs in order to justify further violent protests. I mean, take the, take the case of Armando, Armando Cañizales, who was, um, you know, allegedly killed, you know, um, he was killed at a protest in, um, in Las Mercedes in Caracas you know, it was a very disputed, you know, death because, I mean, there, there was definitely, he was killed by, uh, allegedly by a ball bearing. In fact, there was more ball bearings, you know, of, of that same kind found near the, you know, National Guard where at the same time the video which was presented doesn't at all show the reason why he, I mean, the, the cause of death. In fact, it was edited in order to not show the very moment, you know, that La Carota Digital has been accused of editing that video. So, I mean, it's very, you know, Again, these, these are very murky waters, and to jump to any kind of like you know definitive conclusion, like for example, um, Calle Trece, um, you know the obviously the the uh, hip hop you know re- artist Calle, uh, Presidente from Calle Trece, he came out and he condemned you know the, the murder of Canizales, you know without you know you know again this is far from this person was killed. I mean, there are judicial processes in which, you know, like the evidence has to be weighed and we determine guilt and innocence. You can't just come out and say, oh, this person was murdered by, you know, the government. I mean, there, there, there is ambiguity here. And like, that's not, we don't want to promote impunity against, you know, either the victims of the government, of authorities or of opposition. But anyway, going back to the Ortega, the point yeah. is in, in this context, you know, of, um, yeah, what I would argue are, you know, what what is what is being, you know, this terror that is being sown by opposition um, protesters. Ortega tells the Wall Street Journal, um, and I quote, we can't demand peaceful and legal behavior from citizens if the state takes decisions that don't accord with the law. Right. I mean, I, I, I kind of agree. Obviously, I agree with what she said there. But in the context, it's like, well, as you put it, the government has... I think done a reasonably good job, certainly better than in a lot of countries at holding police to account. Um, looking at it from a different angle, I also thought it's like an important point to make that even being like leftists, I can agree that the right wing opposition in Venezuela does have legitimate criticisms to make of a government. And I got a bit when I first saw Ortega coming out, I was like kind of happy about it. I was like, good, you know what? We've got someone, a prominent you know, left-wing individual who's coming out and criticizing the government and who's in a good position to do so. And I was, you know, I was really happy to see that. But as this saga's dragged on, uh, I guess I've become a little more skeptical of her motives. Like, what exactly is she playing at? Um, or, or why is she doing this all of a sudden, you know? At first, I was, you know, and, and as I said, it's, it's not necessarily out of a position of totally disagreeing with her. Like... The, for example, the referendum, like this is the, the latest, uh, 
I guess, stage of a legal battle has been about a referendum, right? Um, should there have been a referendum before the Constituent Assembly? Now, I'm no expert on Venezuelan constitutional law, but to me it seemed like a legitimate question to ask, like, should there be a referendum? And oh, I was happy to see it ha um, the question asked, but then it's like, okay, well, the issue's settled, I suppose, more or less, like the court's made a decision and we agree with it or not, it's the court. <laughs> so what are you going to do, you know? And she keeps bringing up the same issue over and over again, which... I'm not necessarily opposed to the idea of bringing up an issue if you feel passionate about it and if you don't feel like justice is served, okay, well, you know, you can express your views and, and that seems fine to me, but it just seems, I guess the way she's going about it, and I guess the, um, the, uh, the persistence that she's had, and, but not only that, also the fact that she seems to have adopted a lot of elements of like the opposition rhetoric, which is concerning, like, as you said, you know, she's, uh, arguing uh, about police brutality, which is good, like, good, you need to hold police to account, but by the same token, as you said, like, she's calling for them to be more lenient on protesters when it's already, there's already a lack of investigation into, pro, into opposition violence, and there's already, I think, a lot of efforts to try and hold police to account, so I guess the question is, like, what, what's her game? Where's she going with this? What's the point of this? Like, is she being, like, a reasonable left-wing critic of a government holding the government to account or is, or is is she like as as i think uh, a couple of prominent chavistas said last week is she a quote-unquote a traitor which is something that i i'm not sure i would agree with but it's that's the other extreme i guess or is she somewhere in between like what what's going on yeah i think we should maybe bracket the whole discussion of the uh, national constituent assembly maybe for the next week um, I actually hope to have an article out just uh, analyzing her, her position because that's a whole nother, you know, comp. Right, it's a whole nother can of worms. It is a uh, can of worms, yeah. But I guess to limit, to limit ourselves to the discussion of just, you know, the protester, um, you know, basically the protest deaths and, um, and such. I mean, I, I guess I would say that um, clearly in the case of, of, um, or where were we? That particularly with regard to your, you know, your, your question, you know, I, I, you know, I completely agree with you. Like, I can remember last year when she came out and she um, criticized the OLAP. And for those who don't know, though, it's the Operation Liberation of the People. It's basically like the Maduro government's like anti-crime operation that they came out with in 2015. And really, it's honestly just, in my opinion, it's just, it's just a kind of a brutal criminalization of poor people. You know, the truth is, I mean, it's it's no different than, you know, the, the, the kinds of anti-crime policies that are pursued by other governments in the region, like Brazil or, you know, um, many other Latin American, you know, countries with huge barrios that, you know, basically where they're just completely underserved and, you know, excluded, you know, residents who are just not, you know, receiving the education they need and, you know, the opportunities. And, you know, I mean, obviously, even in Venezuela, it's compounded by the fact that you have, like, 60% of the population is, like, in the for informal economy, that there isn't, like, a productive economy in which you can, like, em you can employ people and give them, like, you know, solid, like, you know, pr uh, I guess, productive jobs, like, for example. Right. You know, and her, not, her, not her, to glorify, but, yeah, I mean, I guess the point is, like, this is, you know, I disagree fundamentally with this anti-crime program, and I think it's a rupture with the Chav with, with Chavez, who, you know, actually promoted, for example, police reform, attempting to actually create, like, community policing um, institutions, you know, basically had the, the UNIS, which is, like, the University of um, National Security, which, like, basically was, was staffed by, like, you know, really progressive, like, you know, radical, like, human rights people, and they were training yeah. the police force. Like, these were really progressive and radical steps, and yeah. this was all abandoned. Yeah, the, I mean, I think criticizing the OLP is, I mean, you can't criticize it enough, and, yeah, and you're totally exactly. right. It's a total break with what Chavez was about. So, the, I guess the, to return to the point before we get lost, that I agree with her on that, and like, you know, again, and I, I agree with her a lot of her positions, but, you know, what I find is, you know, it's not just her statements, like, you know, what she said to the Wall Street Journal or what she says, you know, the way we solve this is, you know, um, this, this confrontation is not by lock, jailing people. I, I agree. Obviously, jailing people is not ever a good thing. But 
in the context of, you know, an active, you know, regime change effort. Again, we can't, we can't underplay this. It's not to say that, like, all of the opposition protesters and all of the opposition leaders are just, you know, puppets, you know, on the strings of Washington. I mean, obviously, it's not like that. But, right, you know, it's much more complicated. The agenda. I mean, Julio Borges did meet with McMaster, the U.S. National Security Advisor, you know, recently, was it last month, in Washington. I mean, you know, there, there is, you know, Mike Pence just issued another statement. I mean, Southcom issued a statement in April. You know, I mean, this is, there clearly is a, you know, active coordination between, you know, Washington and these opposition leaders, you know. So, I mean, that's going on. So in the face of all this and like in any, what in any other country would just be completely unacceptable. These socialists would be brutally crushed in any other country. I mean, just all we have to do is what is ha- what was just happening in Buenaventura, Colombia. Exactly. Recently. Just I mean, across the border. Exactly. Literally, Santos just called in. He called a, what is that, a curfew. He sent in the troops and shut it down. I mean, this is exactly, you know, Brazil. This is exactly what's happening with the anti-coup protests in Brazil. You know, again, Brazil is a, a coup government, as you can see in Ryan's forthcoming article, look for it on Monday, that, you know, this is this is a complete double standard with regard to, you know, Brazil. You know, in any other country, this would be totally repressed to the applause of the international pundit class. Like, there's no doubt about that. But here, you know, you basically have, you know, impunity in a lot of issues a lot of cases and and you know i would say that ortega is responsible for that in the sense that you know she has you know chosen or you know they have not investigated these cases of opposition violence they have you know again we should contrast the the, the, her conduct now with the conduct in 2014 in 2014 she was actually you know prosecuting people you know again i don't believe in applying anti-terrorism legislation but like in the case of Ivan Pernia, who, you know, basically killed this 23-year-old, you know, woman who, because he was shooting at motorcyclists because he thought they were Chavista from his home, and he killed this, like, innocent woman, you know, they charged him with 12 to 18 years. I mean, like, you know, this is the minimal charges, they, you know, the simple intentional homicide. I mean, take this into account that anti-Trump, you know, inauguration protesters are being given 70 to 80 years in jail for breaking windows. And this man is basically going to walk free, could walk free in like 12 years, you know, when, you know, he's not being given the maximum, you know, a a 30 year sentence, which he could be. Not not to say that I'm advocating, you know, that tougher sentences are are the answer. But when we put it in international context, it really comes off as, you know, leniency or even permissiveness towards what is honestly just illegitimate um, violence against what is actually a democratically elected government. So, I sure. Mean, I don't... Yeah, I, I agree totally. And the point that, like, as you said, what is it, like 12 years for in cold blood shooting a totally innocent person you don't even know in Venezuela, you get 12 years for that. In the United States, you break a window and you get 80 years. So it's like an American window is worth eight times more than the life of just an ordinary Venezuelan. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and likewise, I mean, I think she's made some legitimate critiques. Like, I think you put in your article about uh, the, uh, like, military tribunals. Obviously, it's crazy. You, should, you know, these protesters, some of them, as you point out, totally insane and savage to the nth degree. Yet a military tribunal or a military trial doesn't seem appropriate even then. Um, so I, I, I think, I mean, overall, and again, I... I don't. I don't know if I'm sure. Maybe not everyone would agree with me on this, but I, I try, I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, and I, I feel like she's trying to walk a fine line uh, between being critical of the government, holding it to account, while also trying to, I guess, do her job. And I think that over the last week or two, maybe a earlier, I'm not sure, but definitely over the last week or two, she's she's fallen off that line, if that makes sense, and she's. She slipped a little to the right wing, and I don't necessarily, I don't know. I mean, maybe I've heard that a lot of people within the, uh, uh, the her office are, you know, opposition supporters and, and whatever. So maybe she's been influenced in a way to be to lean to what far too much to one side, uh, and this has ended up, you know, making her a little bit biased. But I, I don't know. I, I think she's trying to do the right thing and has fallen fallen for the opposition rhetoric perhaps a little too much like she's drunk a bit too much of a kool-aid if that makes sense 
I don't know. What do you think of that? I think that I think that with regard to the first point about the I would say the right wing infiltration or, or of the public prosecution. I, I think that you know Isias Rodriguez was a former public prosecutor. He gave an interview last month in which he gave some very revealing revelations in which he said that you know Isias Rodriguez is very famous because he was the first government official of the Chavez government official to denounce the two, April 11th, 2002 coup that overthrew Chavez and basically everyone, all of the international media, all of the Venezuelan media, you know, the, the New York yeah. Times, everyone was saying that this was a legitimate, you know, basically Chavez had overstepped his bounds and that, you know, he had resigned and the, the, the you know, the head of the, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, Carmona had you know, taken power. Everyone was saying this was legitimate. He came out and said that Chavez has not resigned, that this is a coup. And he, you know, had denied, he, he revealed that, you know, some like 80 or something um, attorneys within the uh, attorney general's office had denounced him that he'd be removed when that happened. And, you know, basically supporting the coup government. And what he revealed was he, and this is where I think he is completely, you know, uh, should be criticized. He did not remove these people. He did not fire these people. He said, I, I, I prefer to keep them close and be able to watch over them. And he said that not only have these people not disappeared, but they have likely multiplied, you know, yeah. over the past few years, you know. So and then you add to the fact that where are the attorneys coming from that, that joined the um, exactly the, that they're, they're being recruited from, you know, Venezuela's top law schools that are largely right wing that, you know, the the Central University of Venezuela is quite right wing, um, it particularly the law school. So and then the two private, you know, the, the Andres Bello Catholic University and then the Santa Maria you know, these are ex very expensive, you know, private, you know, right wing universities that, you know, are obviously, you know, just um, hot houses of, you know, of anti-government um, you know, sentiment. So, you know, not just anti-government, not just conservative sentiment, as he says, but actually like wanting to just roll back the revolution, just like act reactionary sentiment. So, I mean, these are the people that are in, you know, in fact, you know, there was the case in which a um, recent attorney um in in Guadico state denounced that the basically i mentioned earlier that the uh, the assistant um the vice uh attorney general had resigned over disagreement with um ortega over the the march 29th ruling um concerning the supreme court and all that her opposition to it and the person who replaced her was rafael gonzalez adias and he has been accused by a Guarico attorney general, excuse me, a, a Guarico state prosecutor of basically firing him arbitrarily without any reason. In fact, it wasn't even published in the National Gazette. So it wasn't even like officialized, but he was just he was just notified that he was fired. And he said um, he, he basically said openly that this this guy, Adias, um, has basically arrived at the public prosecutor's office to to persecute um, Chavistas. And I mean that's very concerning that this is this is you know we have a war within this in, within the institutions and that you know basically it's, it's no secret that when Venezuela's government anyone who has you know worked in institutions or has spent enough time there knows that there are a ton of right wing people actually within the government who you know with civil service jobs that are actively you know in fact sabotaging government policy from within so I mean it's very feasible that you know there there is just it may it may not even necessarily be Ortega who is spearheading this but it's as you say ryan it's people around her who you know maybe are giving her bad advice or you know are just at sabotaging from within and i think that you know the other point is though i would ca we have to we have to ask who is ortega personally aligned with that she um who is her husband first of all her husband is german ferrer who is a pesu Diputado de Pesu, but he is, you know, widely kind of, there's you know, wide rumors that he is kind of part of the, the bully bourgeoisie. You know, his, he, he and his daughter have a company in Venezuela. His daughter ha also has a company. She manages a company or in Panama. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, rumors about, you know, the, the illicit ways in which he's made his money. You know, and again, this is not to say that the people who are necessarily in Maduro's camp are clean either, but, you know, clearly there's bully bourgeois, you know, people on either side here. But, you know, this, you know, he is definitely, again, these are 
there, there are a number of press reports. So it's, it's, this is not completely unfounded rumors or gossip. There is some basis to this. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say that this is card hold, you know, cold, hard fact that this, this guy is, you know, corrupt necessarily, but he clearly has amassed his money in questionable ways. Um, and, you know, she's also aligned herself with, for example, um, Miguel Rodriguez Torres, who is the former interior minister. Um, I think he was, he, and he actually was fired under very controversial circumstances. Yeah, it was really weird. Um, but no, it was, it was basically linked to the, the, it was, it was actually like serious human rights abuses. He was, he, you know, Jose Vicente Rangel had exposed it, right? Do you remember the case? It was, it wasn't against the March 5th, um, collective. They, they did this raid, they basically, and this raid in central Caracas on this, you know, basically yeah. these like, um, these young kids who were part of like an armed collective, but they were just some young kids. And like, it was just like completely unnecessary, just like the level of just state brutality, which they visited upon these young kids, you know, to try to, to bring them into line. And they ended up just like, you know, murdering a bunch of, you know, poor kids. And yeah. it was exposed. I don't know if you want to add any details to that. Um, no, no, it's just the whole the whole saga was a little bit insane. If I right, remember exactly. correctly. So like this, this guy, this you know, he he was exposed. He was fired from his job, and rightly, I would say. And you know, he is one of her allies. And I mean, he he's a he's a, he's a hardline you know evangelical Christian, you know, very conservative. Um, but he presents himself as kind of like a critical chavista, as like trying to like you know. As you know, basically trying to rebrand. You know, there's a whole like group of like ant- former government ministers who are trying to like distance themselves from the government and rebrand themselves as like kind of like a cool non you know non authoritarian critical chavismo and, and like hoping that oh well if we can just oust Maduro from power we can just win an election. So my my personal feeling is that this guy has presidential ambitions and that Ortega is kind of part of his clan in a certain way or like you know definitely sees him as an ally. You know, and it's it's he he personally is someone who I I think is incredibly dangerous. Um, in in terms of you know he's very similar I would say in many ways to um Cleaver Alcala, who is a former um major general. He was um he was a, a, a comrade of Chavez's on the during the coup of um, 4th of February to the, of 1992. And he, you know, he's accused, uh, he's taken, become, taken a very clear anti-government posture and he's kind of like tried to rebrand himself, you know, from the left, like Miguel Rodriguez Torres, but he's accused of human rights abuses by the Paymon people. He's declared persona non grata for his role in commanding that uh, military district, you know, it, within, in, in Bolivar State, close to the Amazon, you know, where the, actually the Arco Minero, the mining arc, Another controversial yeah. Maduro power. Being <laughs> yeah, well, out. speaking but, of cans of worms. Exactly. But he, he has postured himself as a spokesperson against this policy, yet he himself is accused of human rights abuses by the very indigenous peoples who pop, you know, populate or you know, who call that area their ancestral home. So, I mean, right. you know, ironies will be ironies. So, I mean, the point is that Ortega is running around with some quite unsavory characters if you want my opinion, and I, I would definitely question her motives in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I guess, looking to, to wrap up, I guess uh, it, it definitely seems obvious that there is this, like, uh, there are a number of, like, high-profile chavistas, and not just high-profile chavistas, but just a lot of chavistas who, who understand, I think, that there's a very high chance that Maduro, well, Maduro himself is not going to be running again, I don't think. I'd be surprised if he runs successful in the next election. Um, but definitely there's this idea that the, the, the Chavista establishment, if you, if you want to call it that, or the, you know, the kind of, of Chavismo that has run Venezuela for, you know, since, for, since, uh, 1999 is, is in danger and there's a very high risk that it, that there will have to be some kind of change. And I think you're right that a lot of these people are thinking, can they try to position themselves as like Chavismo light? Or something like that, or like the critical chavistas, or, or something along those lines. Something, you know, something that could possibly fill the void uh, in the future, perhaps in the next election cycle, even the, the cycle after. Um, but I, I think you're also right to point out that most of these people, most of these supposedly chavista light individuals, or these supposedly like, you know, middle road characters, are anything but. You know, they're just kind of 
bully bourgeoisie or they're they're opportunists who understand who see where the wind is blowing and and want to try and put themselves in the best position as they are as they can be uh in order to you know continue their political careers after the maduro yeah. administration has you know disappeared uh or at best they're just they're at best they're you know intellectuals who are just totally removed from the grassroots yeah that too that too that's also totally possible but I, I guess the the overall point is that like obviously it's great to have criticism from the left and I would never be opposed to that. Like I think it's excellent to have as much criticism of, of Maduro and of the government as possible from the left. But by the same time, I think you're very right in pointing out that we have to be skeptical of the people doing the criticism as well and be open to criticizing them and say, okay, well, where are you coming from exactly? Why are you doing this? And for me, it just seems like, yeah, it's a lot of it's opportunism. I'm not necessarily sure if it's Ortega herself who is opportunistic because she, has, she just doesn't strike me as that kind of person. But, I mean, I don't know her personally, obviously, but just that, it's just my opinion, you know? It's just a, a feeling I get. But I certainly would think there's people around her, and there are definitely fellow travellers, as you pointed out, who are, I think, opportunists and who don't necessarily have motives that are in the best interests of the country, but are just looking at preserving themselves into the next election cycle and, you know, into the future of politics. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily agree. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be necessarily opportunism on her part. But, and again, I think this is, we should kind of like pay this as a sequel, um, as a segue to our sequel conversation the next week to talk about the question of the constitutional um, constituent assembly. That I think that while she necessarily isn't being um, opportunistic and that I don't think she has presidential ambitions, but I do think she's pursuing a, a reactionary agenda, you know, and, and I think the manner in which her she is framing her opposition to the, the constituent assembly is very disingenuous on a lot of levels. But we can unpack that next week. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's a good point to uh, to wrap up and uh, leave it for next time to be continued. <laughs> so cool. cool. Well, thanks so much uh, for the conversation, Lucas. And uh, yeah, for anyone. Uh, listening, be sure to check out Lucas's article on uh, on VenezuelaAnalysis.com. It should be going up soon. Is Venezuela's Attorney General biased towards the opposition? Uh, it's a really good summary of everything we've spoken about today, uh, and also just yeah, a really good summary of what exactly is going on between Ortega and and the Supreme Court. Anyway, thanks so much. Uh, have a great weekend, Ben. Yeah, have a great weekend, Ryan. Take care. Thanks a lot. You Take too. Care. See Bye. you next time.